So, good afternoon, or rather good evening. Uh, we, as most of you know, Professor Alan Guth has already given his talk yesterday, so we will only have two talks. Uh, both are on the CMB, uh, and uh, what I suggest is that we ask uh, questions at the end of each talk, which are specific to the experiment. And uh, questions that pertain to both experiments, please postpone until the end because we will have some discussion at the end, in addition to the questions to the speakers. And Professor Alan Good has also accepted to be present in case there are questions in theory, he will help us. Okay, so with that, uh, we start with the session and the first speaker is uh, Dr. Roger O'Brien from uh, JPL and Caltech on the detection of degree scale B mode polarization with BICEP2. Please. Uh, can people hear me? Yep. All right, so thanks for the intro. Uh, in case you missed it, my name is Roger O'Brien uh, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory out of Caltech, and I'll be speaking on behalf of the BICEP2 collaboration today. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking here uh, in this capacity, and in fact, our team feels honored that you guys formed a plenary session focused on our recent result. And if this result holds up, but even in part, then we as a, as a community suspect we'll have the privilege of working with many of you in the not too distant future. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to spend the, hello, the, uh, the first bit of my talk uh, discussing the, the physical mechanism that gives rise to this B-mode signature. It's a bit obscure outside of our immediate research circles, but if you're gonna be coming aboard, you better understand it. Uh, we'll uh, describe the instruments that we've used as well as the maps and spectra that we've produced. Uh, I'll offer up a strictly cosmological interpretation, one that, that temporarily uh, ignores the possibility of foregrounds. If nothing else, this should uh, motivate us to, to develop a deeper understanding of what is in the, the field that we mapped on. And so I'll delay this discussion of systematics and foregrounds to the end of the discussion, uh, end of the talk. Uh, this is uh, dry, but it's important. I don't want people walking out of here thinking that the people on our team are reckless yahoos. Uh, we actually thought through this for a year and a half before we published. So uh, it'll also be a nice uh, segue into some of the remarks that, that Enrique will be making on Planck. So we'll start with B modes. Uh, this is the history of our universe in timeline form, where this increasing vertical scale here reflects the expansion of our universe, uh, most of which occurred in the first fraction of a second during inflation. When that process ended, the fields driving it should have decayed into uh, hot ionized matter and remained that way for the next 400,000 years until the universe had finally cooled enough for atoms to first form at uh, recombination. And at that point in time, the, uh, the microwave background photons are released. We can still see them on our telescopes 14 billion years later, albeit redshifted by subsequent expansion here into the millimeter spectral regime. So, uh, you know, Alan covered the inflation basics yesterday in his talk uh, fairly well, but in the spirit of, uh, of review, I'll just remind you that this involved a superluminal expansion and that uh, we suspect the universe underwent a 60-some uh, 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 of, of expansion in the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. And this is handy for a number of theoretical reasons. It dilutes away various relic particles that we don't find in practice. Uh, it uh, explains the nearly flat geometry we see in the CMB. It explains the homogeneity and isotropy of our universe. It explains the nearly scale invariant matter power spectrum uh, uh, that's related to the nearly uh, time invariant nature of uh, inflation slow roll. And last but not least, this amplifies quantum fluctuations to the background uh, gravitational metric out to cosmic scales and thus observable scales. And this should intrigue everyone in the room because it's one of our few opportunities to get a handle on quantum features of gravity. Now, arguably the most important of these metric perturbations are scalar in nature. Uh, they're basically gravitational wells, and uh, when they are inflated, they uh, inflate so rapidly that opposite sides of a given well fall out of causal contact only to reestablish communication later on. That's, we call this exiting and reentering the causal horizon. And when they reenter, they trigger and drive acoustic oscillations, sound waves, in this early uh, 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 primordial plasma that locally heats and cools regions there, and in particular at the surface of last scattering, uh, uh, thus inducing uh, temperature anisotropies. So this is Planck's full sky map. Uh, they have removed the average uh, 3 Kelvin temperature as well as, uh, as some foregrounds to reveal tens of micro Kelvin uh, variations. And these spots here would one day go on to form things like stars and galaxies. So you can distill most of the useful information from these maps into an angular power spectrum. So this is showing the variance of spot temperature in micro K squared versus reciprocal of spot size. And for those who aren't used to looking at them, I'll, I'll orient you to the fact that large scale features are shown at left and finer features are shown at the right. 
so uh, you can think of this as a Fourier transform of this map, and it has the fingerprints of inflation all over it. The, uh, in particular, this peaked structure here naturally arises from, from inflation. It synchronizes those, uh, those acoustic oscillations, and that phase coherence naturally gives rise to an echo pattern. A remarkable cosmology has been done uh, with these sorts of plots, and in many ways, uh, Planck is the culmination of these efforts. So uh, inflation should also amplify uh, tensor modes or gravitational waves out to cosmic scales. Uh, these might sound more exotic than gravitational wells, but astrophysically speaking, they're actually not as interesting because these don't really participate in structure formation in that meaningful way. When they re-enter the causal horizon, uh, they simply decay away. They get redshifted away by expansion. But in terms of fundamental physics, they're of utmost importance. And that's because an optically driven history of our universe might look more like this. Right? This scattering here makes this opaque to us. And in many ways, the surface of last scattering here uh, is like a screen that we can't see behind, at least not optically. We have to rely upon other particles and effects to learn about this. And arguably, the gravitational waves are the grandest prize of all, uh, because not only can they penetrate this, but they, uh, they originate during inflation itself. They can teach us about physics at temperatures one trillion times hotter than what can be attained over the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, more to the point, the ratio in the tensor modes to the scalar modes, tensor ratio R here, should be proportional to the energy scale of inflation, which is predicted to be at grand unified temperatures. It, it needs to be in order to make good on that laundry list of promises that we articulated a couple slides ago. So uh, gravitational waves are notoriously difficult to detect, but fortunately they can induce a, a distinct polarization signature in the microwave background through Thompson scattering, the same mechanism that polarizes the afternoon sky. So in fact, both the tensor and scalar modes participate. If you just consider one scalar mode, uh, with, and it's associated acoustic wave with alternating hot and cold planes. An electron at last scattering in this scenario might see hot coming in from one side and then cold on the opposite axis. And so it's going to scatter partially polarized light. But here's the catch. It has to be parallel or perpendicular to this acoustic wave vector. It, 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 it knows no other direction. Uh, that relationship, parallel or perpendicular, is preserved under parity. So you expect even parity E modes, as we call them, from this. You would not expect the odd symmetry B mode pattern. Uh, despite the fact that this is a complete basis for describing linear polarization. Now, gravitational waves don't have this restriction. As they travel, in this case, left to right, uh, they're squeezing and stretching space on um, mutually orthogonal axes, which means they're creating hot and cold. But remember, the gravitational waves have their own internal degree of freedom, their own polarization, which means that this can scatter light at an oblique angle uh, and can thus populate both the E modes and the B modes. So there's nothing special about the gravitational waves in this context. It's actually the, the scalar waves that were special because they can only produce E. So these are single modes. If you throw many of them together in the sky, as we see in practice, then they combine to make patterns like this. So the E modes, I'll stress for you here, uh, have an even parity upon combination, uh, uh, having circular and asterisk-looking patterns. Uh, the B modes, on the other hand, wind up producing these sort of pinwheel structures that's odd in parity. So I, I want you to memorize these shapes. We're going to look for them in our maps in a moment. We're going to play a game of Where's Waldo. It won't be hard. The only thing you need to know in addition is what's the size of these features in the sky. So this is, again, an angular power spectrum. Uh, and so you remember temperature from earlier. This is, of course, simulations. Red here is an E-mode curve. Uh, and then blue is a range of possibilities for a gravitational wave background from uh, producing uh, B-modes. And there's two cu crucial features here. One is that this is peaking at the degree angular scale, about two degrees, which is huge on the sky. The full moon is like a half degree, so you don't need a lot of resolving power to see this, but you do need sensitivity because it's down by a number of order of magnitudes from temperature. Now, uh, there's this other curve here from gravitational lensing as a non-primordial B-mode effect. That peaks at, at the arc minute scale, uh, so you need larger instruments to resolve that uh, and more expensive instruments. But if your priority is the gravitational wave signature here, then one naturally is driven towards an instrument that emphasizes sensitivity over resolution. So that was our team's strategy. This is the team uh, based out of Harvard, Stanford, Caltech, where I am, and University of Minnesota. So uh, BICEP2 integrated on the sky for three years. It's now retired. Keck Array is five copies of BICEP2 and, and is mapping as we speak. Uh, so when people hear the name Keck, they often think of a telescope in Hawaii. Uh, we chose a less hospitable location, about a mile north of the geographic South Pole. So this photo that you've been looking at is BICEP2. Uh, here's another sh photo. So this is standing next to the ground shield for Keck Array. This building off in the distance is the base where everyone sleeps while they're not down there. That's immediately adjacent to the South Pole. Uh, if you turn around and look north, you would see this, the Dark Sector Laboratory. So this housed BICEP2 for three years, and in the very near future, it will house BICEP3, which is a much more powerful camera. 
This is a uh, South Pole telescope off in the distance. It's a larger aperture machine, more suited for the, uh, the, uh, the gravitational lensing measurements. So this is one of the best places in the world to do this science, uh, and principally because it is so dry there. You're standing on two miles of ice when you're here, so you're already at high elevation, and then it's so damn cold that it just freezes the rest of the water out of the air. And this is critical because water can absorb and re-emit the millimeter waves that we're trying to measure. Uh, additionally, it's true that the sun will rise once a year and then set once a year. Uh, and that's, that's actually very useful to us because uh, the daily rising and setting of the sun that you get at mid-latitudes introduces atmospheric noise by churning up the atmosphere. So we don't have to deal with that as much. Uh, the downside, of course, is once the sun sets, you are stuck there for the winter. There's no flights in or out. We leave behind a couple uh, intrepid team members who maintain our instruments. And there are uh, two of uh, 40 of a skeleton crew down there. Uh, and they get to enjoy night skies like this. The, uh, uh, one last advantage here is that the actual sky and the field we integrate on just rotates above us in a circle. It never sets, never goes below the horizon. So in principle, you can map 24-7, 365 days a year. You can engage in what we refer to as relentless observing. So these are the five Keck cameras. Each of these sweeps back and forth, takes about a, a, a minute, so it's sped up. We go at constant elevation for a while, then we stop and we nod up and down. And there it goes. That's a calibration maneuver to, to remove differential gain between detectors. And we do that because we want to subtract the, the polarization states in the, uh, in the time stream uh, to remove uh, atmospheric noise that, that is nonetheless still present to some extent. Uh, then we continue mapping at a different elevation. It takes a better part of a day to map out the entire field. And then we rotate in boresight, uh, and that's important because we want to map at different angles to reconstruct polarization. And we also use that to afford us systematic controls. So this thing isn't huge. Uh, here are some people for scale. Uh, if you had Superman vision, you could see inside this enclosure, and one of the cameras might look like this. It's about the size of a person, just large enough to get the job done. That's our mantra here. Uh, there, uh, it contains a pair of plastic lenses that re-image the sky onto a focal plane down here. Uh, and they set the resolution here of about a half degree on the sky at our, at our two millimeter uh, observing band. Again, just enough to see that two degree feature that we're interested in. We put the whole thing inside of a cryostat and we chill the interior optics to about four Kelvin. That reduces the loading on our focal plane so we can build highly sensitive detectors. So the detectors look like this. These are fabricated in-house by my very close colleagues here uh, up at JPL. And uh, these are the equivalent of a CCD array for a modern digital camera, except instead of a megapixel array, it's just a few hundred, which we can get away with because the wavelength is several thousand times longer than optical. So the pixels look like this. They're dominated in footprint by a planar phased array antenna. Uh, if you zoom in here, you see that it's actually dual polarized. So these are the sub antennas, and there's two orientations. It's really just two antennas that are superposed. And the waves are fed together in this planar transmission line. You can see it in these white lines here. Uh, so that does the beam synthesis. We route power through little integrated band-defining filters. This restricts the power to 150 gigahertz with a 20% fractional bandwidth. That corresponds to about two millimeters in wavelength. And then finally dump power here at transition edge sensors. There's two of them, one per polarization. Now I could chew your ear off for hours about this. This is my area of expertise, but time doesn't permit. Uh, instead, I'll just remark that thanks to this entirely planar design that we can realize that with photolithographic techniques, we could make lots of these in a hurry and we had in excess of 3,000 detectors on the sky between these instruments. And as a result, we enjoy very high sensitivity. Uh, we can therefore integrate uh, down or average down the, the, the noise faster than our competition. So uh, it still takes a while. It's a faint signal. It takes years. Uh, we don't have years now, but I have a video where I've sped this up for your viewing enjoyment. So this is Q here integrating down. Uh, so it's a difference between vertical and horizontal, and this isn't going very quickly. Uh, and then this is uh, U here, so it's, it's a difference along the diagonals. Uh, and so this is meant to be a cursor tracing time, although it's going very slow. Uh, and, uh, and so what you'll notice at the end of the first year when it gets there is there's going to be vertical and horizontal stripes in, uh, in, in Q and diagonal ones in U, which is indicative of underlying E-mode pattern, uh, one that's dominated by E-modes. Uh, so these are difference maps off to the side. They're what we call jackknifes. So we take the data and split it, and we subtract it. Uh, and, uh, and that's meant to difference away the signal. If we see any residuals in there, then we know we have a systematic concern. Uh, but it's also a means of uh, measuring the noise. Wow, this is just stopping. So uh, anyway, this integrates down to around uh, 3 nanokelvin uh, over the course of three years, which is uh, unprecedented in the literature. So, were these to complete, you'd take a linear combination of them uh, to produce a map that looks like this. So this is, uh, this is the total polarization. You'll see immediately this dominated by uh, circular patterns and asterisk patterns. Uh, in other words, it's dominated by E modes. Uh, and in fact, we filter out everything but, uh, but E instead of total. You can see it's almost unchanged. And I'll flip back and forth so you can see that total and E. 
there's a very slight difference. So it's dominated by that. If we filter out everything but the B mode component, it's less impressive at first, but we can just change the length scale, and we see that you have this sort of uh, pinwheel-looking pattern here. Uh, you should note that it's prominent at the degree angular scale and is roughly uniform across our field. Uh, the way we make our maps naturally re leads to apatization along the edges. So uh, here are the two side by side with a color scale. They're different color scales. I want to emphasize that. So E and B. People have been seeing E for years in other experiments, but the B one, that's new. You might wonder if this is noise, and the answer is we don't think so because we've, we've simulated our instrument end to end. But when it looks at a sky uh, that would be uh, devoid of any degree scale features. And so now I'm showing the measured map above and then the noise map below from simulations. Uh, and you can see it under predicts that. And in fact, we've done 500 of these, these simulations. And you can use them to construct error bars when you finally take this map into Fourier space, into the angular power spectrum. All right, so that looks like this. So again, variance of temperature versus uh, reciprocal spot size. These, uh, these points here are, are band powers, uh, and the uh, error bars are from, from simulation. And you can see that we're seeing an excess power at the degree angular scale that exceeds a null hypothesis of lensing only at 5.3 significance, 5.3 sigma significance. Uh, blue here is a spectrum from our jackknife maps. Uh, that ought to look like zero, right? That's a systematic check. It should be consistent with zero. It is. You might worry that it's a bit high with a PTE of 0.99. All I can remark is that we've made hundreds of these jackknives, well, between one and 200, and, uh, and they have a uniform distribution between zero and one, as you might expect. Uh, this one just happens to look high. All right, so what does this mean? Well, if we interpret it strictly as cosmological, you can already see the punchline coming, even if you hadn't read the news. Just by looking at the comparison of, of the, the, the color bars here, you can see that's a five to one ratio, which in turn means that uh, with a more thorough and careful analysis that R has a likelihood of peaking around 0.2. Uh, so this is showing uh, the band powers that matter most here, and these uh, reject a, if you, if you phrase it strictly in terms of tensors, these will reject a uh, R equals zero scenario at actually a seven sigma significance. So it's an even better fit in this scenario. So these uh, note also show the excess more or less where you would expect for a gravitational wave background. Right, so we can also see lensing, gravitational lensing. So this is the, the, the full uh, uh, spectrum. And uh, of course, it's the high L uh, points that matter most here. Uh, and you can see them increasing. Uh, this is a confidence contours of A sub L, the lensing amplitude versus R. This amplitude here, by convention, should be unity for lambda CDM cosmology. And indeed, Planck, using temperature data and other sets, have, have constrained this to be around about unity. Uh, we see it as well through polarization, uh, although you can see that it's scattered a bit high here, and it's driven by these points here. These are what we regard as basically statistical fluctuations. And in fact, we don't see it in the, the modern data sets that we're getting out of uh, Keck array. Uh, but nonetheless, they drive it high, two sigma-ish. Um, if you marginalize over R, we detect lensing at 5.5 uh, sigma. So people have noted that there is tension between uh, R measurements and uh, temperature constraints on R. You can constrain R through temperature uh, because uh, uh, because the, uh, at the very largest scales here, at low L, uh, those modes would not have yet de uh, decayed away at recombination, so they can add power on this plateau. It's degenerate with other cosmological parameters, so it's a challenging thing to constrain. Uh, and the, uh, uh, it's also challenging further because you're limited by cosmic variance here, a, a finite number of modes that you can sample on the sky. There's also this anomalous little bump downward at L of 25 that's present in both uh, Planck and WMAP data, so it's real. Uh, but it actually makes the data prefer negative values of R, which are unphysical. The likelihood peaks at negative R. So it's a bit squirrely to constrain this. Uh, nonetheless, it's popular to co-plot confidence uh, contours with R and N sub S, the scalar spectral index, that quantifies the depth of the gravitational wells as a function of their physical size, uh, essentially from the slope of this. And so here are the plots, and I'll emphasize this is from Planck from a couple of years ago. So blue shows such constraints, and if you marginalize over N sub S, then uh, R winds up being less than 0.11 at 95% confidence. But you can even see here that the, 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 the likelihood is peaking for negative values. Uh, if you allow N sub S to run, to change as a function of physical scale, then the, the constraints loosen considerably, and that's what's shown in orange. And in fact, it can now accommodate uh, values uh, of 0 0.2. Uh, and in fact, if you take those likelihood chains and you uh, import and sample them with a bicep R uh, likelihood, then you get this sort of joint constraint. So this is one means of resolving this tension. We don't advocate it as the means, uh, but uh, we look forward to other people offering other possibilities. Right, so at this point in time, uh, you should, you're invited to be critical of this, and you know, we welcome your scrutiny. You may be wondering, could this be a systematic, or could it be some sort of a foreground effect? Uh, I, we, by convention, bin these as separate categories, so instrumental systematics or foregrounds, and I'll, I'll discuss them separately. 
So we handle systematics in a few different ways. One is with these null tests or jackknifes, and there must be an equivalent in particle physics that I'm simply not aware of. This table here is from a paper. You're not meant to read it from the audience. It's really just here for shock and awe. Uh, to convince you that we did a lot of tests, but go read it in the paper if you want. This is showing uh, 14 different tests, three spectra each, and four different statistics we computed. And this table is a, a number of probabilities to exceed. Uh, you should be looking for low values in here, uh, less than 1%. Than you won't find many. It's okay to have one or two every now and then. You do, after all, expect a uniform distribution of these uh, between 0 and 1. So, uh, so we basically pass our jackknife test, which gives us a, a lot of confidence. We, of course, can do simulations. This is a handful of systematic concerns that we simulated end-to-end -end through the instrument, and you can see that it underpredicts the measured signal by a significant margin. Uh, the one big thing that we had to deal with was uh, with beam mismatches. So we remember we difference in the time stream, and that means you better have your beams of your polarization pair as well aligned. Uh, if they differ in gain or pointing, then the difference patterns look like this, or they differ in widths. They look like these, uh, and these can leak temperature and its gradients into polarization. And it would have been a big problem if we'd done nothing about it. This is in green would be the leaked signal. Of course, we did understand this was a concern and modified our pipeline in a way to filter away contaminated modes. And, and these levels here are showing what happens when you introduce that filtering. So lastly, we can, we can cross-correlate between different instruments. Uh, BICEP-1 uh, was the predecessor experiment with radically different detectors and radically different readout uh, architecture, uh, albeit less detectors. We can cross between that data set and BICEP-2. And we still see this excess signal, uh, albeit now at three sigma, just because there was less sensitivity from BICEP-1. We can also cross-correlate between BICEP-2 and Kekere, and that cross-spectrum is shown in blue, uh, and, and that also sees the excess. Uh, you'll also note that these points that had scattered high are, are absent in, uh, in the Keck data, or at least in the cross-correlation. So, uh, so this gives us great confidence that this is something on the sky that's at least astrophysical. Now, you might worry, could it be a foreground? And for those of you who are interested in possibly doing astrophysics, uh, I think a couple cautionary quotes are, are useful here. So Zeldovich once remarked that the universe is the poor man's particle accelerator. Uh, and indeed, we are poor compared to you guys. You should see our budgets. And, and so to some extent, you get what you pay for, right? Like, we can access, in principle, marvelous energy scales, uh, but, uh, uh, but then we have to deal with the nuisance of foregrounds. We don't get to do controlled laboratory experiments. Another quote that's a little grittier that I like, I think, is from Martin Rees, who once said that particle physics is like playing chess, astrophysics is like mud wrestling. Right, so how do we differentiate the CMB from the metaphorical mud? And the answer is they have different frequency spectra. So this is showing essentially integrated power instead of intensity here, these, these, these dependencies for both synchrotron and dust. Uh, and uh, you see that synchrotron is termed red. It decreases with increasing frequency, whereas the antenna temperature or power increases uh, with, uh, with dust. It's less blue, whereas CMB should be more, more or less flat in these units. And the challenge for BICEP2 is that it was basically a monochromatic instrument integrating away at 150 gigahertz. Uh, and, and, uh, and that might sound crazy, except that the plan was always to integrate till we saw something and then diversify in colors. And we have with Keck Array. Two of the five cameras are integrating at 100 gigahertz as we speak, and they're actually uh, 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 four, three to four times deeper than what we'd attain with the few pixels we had at BICEP1 at that color. Right? But for now, we have to rely upon external data sets. Synchrotron, that's fine. WMAP, uh, map polarization at 22 gigahertz, so very sensitive to, uh, to synchrotron. Uh, if we scale that up to our frequency band in our field, we see that it greatly underpredicts the measured signal, and more importantly, the cross correlation is consistent with zero. So that's not really a good explanation. explanation. Now, the equivalent data set for uh, Planck is not public yet. That's the 350 gigahertz channel. Um, so at the time when we published, we were stuck comparing to models that effectively re reflect the collective wisdom of our field uh, at that time. Uh, so these models here uh, underpredict the signal. Uh, they're empirically driven models, but still models. Uh, and the cross correlations are consistent with zero. So, uh, but nonetheless, they're still models, and this can be improved upon. Lastly, uh, the, the BICEP1 data had 25 pixels at 100 gigahertz, so we can cross-correlate there and check to see if the spectra are consistent or not. Uh, and if they are, then you would believe it's CMB. If it's not, then you might be seeing hints of the, the, another foreground. So this is a likelihood from that analysis peaking at near CMB with a, a mild disfavoring of synchrotron and dust. So we reject dust really like a 1.7 sigma significance. So this really isn't something that you can necessarily hang your hat on, but it's, it's somewhat encouraging. And most of our efforts now are, are geared towards improving this, the tightness of this. Now, of course, Planck has released some of their data uh, in a recent set of papers. And so uh, this is their map of polarization fraction. It's the fraction of the light that is polarized. And, uh, and unfortunately, these regions in the galact high galactic uh, ranges are excluded. Uh, they're still working on the systematics there, but that's heartbreaking to us, of course, because the BICEP2 field is right in there. So this data isn't terribly useful to us in a direct way for understanding what's on our field. 
Um, but nonetheless, they have given some hints of what might be going on, although they're still working on it. This is actually a map from a couple years ago showing the, the uh, optical depth at that frequency at different points in the sky, and it's proportional to the, essentially the column density of, of, of gas and dust in there. And I'm, I'm showing this to you because they released this plot in May. So this is showing polarization fraction and then column density here. Uh, and these points are showing essentially how many points within their map. And I, I believe this might be from including the high galactic regions, although it's slightly unclear from the paper. But uh, this nonetheless is showing the points from that map and, and how many there are at a given set of those criteria. So here is where the bicep two field lies, right? This is our, our column density. Uh, and so you can see there's a very wide range of possible polarization fractions, whereas the collective wisdom previously would have said it's probably around 5%. I'll point out here that if you want to explain the entire signal away in terms of dust, then you would need a uniform distribution uh, or polarization at 13% at the upper range here. But you know, really the only way to make progress on this is to cross-correlate our data with theirs. And, uh, and so uh, that will almost certainly be happening. Uh, we're in the final stages of, of making an agreement to collaborate, and both teams are really enthusiastic to move forward on this one. Right, so I'll just briefly remark what's next in the field. So here's where we are now. We have a number of upper bounds set by other experiments in the past decade. Detection of degree scale stuff from, of some sorts from uh, BICEP2. Uh, and then a peak from gravitational lensing that's been seen by South Pole Telescope and Polar Bear. Uh, this is at higher angular scales here. And so this is uh, actually really good timing because I think that after we've decided we understand what this is and if it's really cosmic, the next step is to begin to test and to explore whether this really satisfies a, a scale invariant uh, uh, tensor spectrum. So you need to go to other angular scales. Uh, and in particular, if you want to go to this region, you're going to have to map out this lensing and apply algorithms to de-lens our maps uh, and dig below this lensing floor. Uh, but that's an important thing to do because long term, we're going to want to be able to measure this slope here, the, the tensor spectral index, and compare it against the amplitude, the, uh, the R here. Uh, by doing that comparison, you can learn more about inflationary physics and in particular make statements about how many fields are involved. So. Um, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, just remark that the, uh, you can go find the papers and our data products at bicep.tech.org. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And uh, are there uh, questions, comments on this uh, specifically to Bicep2? Uh, yes, I see a hand over there. In the back. Maybe right. you, could you repeat the I question? Said, yes. when, when will you have enough of the biceps, the three data at dual frequencies to say anything? So, uh, so bicep three, and I, I didn't have time to talk about this, that, that is not yet deployed. Um, but Keck Array has two cameras at uh, 100 gigahertz. BICEP3 will be as many detectors as Keck Array, but all 100 gigahertz. Um, so the, I guess the real question is, when do we have enough data from, from Keck to, to improve the constraints? Uh, and, and the answer is that, that we suspect we have enough now to begin improving it, uh, and we're working on the analysis of that as we speak. Uh, the, the, the map depths with Keck Array are now uh, about four times deeper than what we had attained with the original uh, BICEP1 detectors, but uh, it would be, uh, I, I, it's, it's not useful for me to comment on, on, on how much we can prove that right now, because uh, that's ongoing analysis. Okay, any other question or comment? Yes. Uh, on the first row. Well, yes. I can hear you and you repeat it, so. Oh, no, he's, got a, he's right behind you. Okay. I was wondering about the second structure that you see a larger value of the multiple. Um, this is this is a L of around 200, 300. There. Yeah, if hold you go on. Back, Oops, that's off. If you try to uh, assess the local p-value of that uh, of that structure there. If I try to assess what? The local p-value of the second structure. This right here. Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I, okay. So I, I think I understand what you're asking, which is what's what's the significance of this? Right. Uh, and I so if I remember the numbers correctly, that the the, uh, the fit to a, a um, the fit here to a, to a, a tensor spectrum uh, is essentially, uh, I think it's about 40% PTE when you include these points, and it winds up being 90% when you, when you exclude the upper points and just use the bottom five band power. So it's, it's still an acceptable fit, and it, and it hints at these being essentially a sort of a, a two sigma deviation. So, you know, we, we've we certainly agonized over this. It's not pretty looking, um, but uh, statistically speaking, uh, 
we don't think it's meaningful, especially when we saw the CAC array data not showing it as well. Does that answer your question? Some? Okay. Yes? Any? Could you go back to where you had the disfavor? It was disfavored by the dust by one point. Yeah, yeah this, this, one. this 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 thing. Yeah. Uh, why isn't that a, a showstopper? I mean, why doesn't that um, slow you down and and um, you know make you wait until you can get this number to be more? You well, know. I would I would say it was mildly higher, although it might not might might not satisfy you anyway. It, it was. So the analysis, uh, uh, I think, was done with a, a small error that was, was pointed out to us by one of our colleagues at Princeton, this fellow Raphael Flagre. So it used to be at a 2.2 .2 sigma level, um, which is only a mild improvement. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, this was, this was something that we had worked on, and uh, you know, it never seemed like it was really going to be a, a winning strategy anyway, but it was, I think, just due diligence to try. We don't have that much sensitivity from BICEP1, but it was worth trying. You know, what, what, what really, I think, uh, convinced us that this, well, the, the, that made us think this was likely cosmic in nature is, the, is the, the, the collection of all the other evidence that I presented. So there's, you know, there's a, a, a expectation for many years of people studying dust that it should have, have a low level of polarization. Uh, and there's the, you know, uniform distribution in our field and the, uh, and the, the structure that's prevalent at the degree angular scale. So, you know, I, I, uh, I think that if we saw this being tightly peaked here, it would be the opposite of a showstopper. It would, would greatly encourage us. The fact that it wasn't tightly peaked uh, suggests to us that we, we simply need more sensitivity. Okay. Uh, I don't see any, any other hand. Yes, Chunky. No? Okay. I, I, I'd be happy to talk to you after if you'd like. But <laughs> okay. So, if not, uh, thank you, Ian. So.